Good morning. So this morning I have the water running uh, through the drip lines and it's just one turn of the valve and my entire garden, uh, my entire eastern garden is watered all at the same time. Because it's a low pressure drip irrigation, it doesn't take a whole lot of water in order to fill all of the pipes and the drip tape. So everything gets watered all at once and that alleviates a whole lot of work on my part so I can focus on other things. So I don't have to change um, where the water is going. I just turn all of the valves on unless I don't want to water a spot and then I'll turn that valve off specifically. Um, I don't have water to the trees just yet so all of the fruit trees that I have around I still have to hand water but what I do is I take my fish water from my previous aquaponics system uh, so I still have the tank 55 gallons and I still have the fish so they're still producing poop uh, but I'm able to take that water and use it to water all of my trees uh, I add a little bit of compost tea to that just to make sure that they're getting enough nutrients but not too much because we want to we want to grow roots and structure but we want to make sure that we also get fruit so certain trees don't get as much nitrogen as others. But in the meantime, we are here in the garden to look at everything that is growing. So let's, uh, let's go down the line. So bed number three here, well, let's start in bed number one. Bed number one is uh, Brussels sprouts and garlic. Now I did plant my garlic way too late. It should have been in around September, October timeframe but I didn't get it into the ground until about January. And then we had some serious hard freezes. So it is sparse, but I'm still gonna get garlic from it. So I'm, I'm happy with that. The Brussels sprouts are in late. Um, if you've been watching previous videos, I'll share the link below. The, the first planting all was burned up. So I was at, at the AI course uh, and I had everything planted, uh, did everything great. It was getting kind of cold, but for that four days, no one took the plastic off during the day. And so the low tunnels heated up to the point that it just basically burned everything and killed everything that was in the ground. So I had to start over again and starting over means starting seeds and then waiting for them to be big enough and old enough to be able to plant in the ground and then plant them in the ground and wait for them to grow. So we were definitely late on the cold crops, but as you can see, some of them are growing, uh, growing pretty well. It is supposed to get 103 degrees tomorrow. So I'm watering everything today in order to prepare them for that excessively high temperature. Uh, one day at high temperature is not too bad. Uh, today's supposed to be in the 90s. Monday's supposed to be 103. Tuesday's supposed to be in the 90s. And then it's going to drop back down into the 70s and 80s. Uh, probably most likely it's going to be in the 80s. So they're not going to like it, but they'll do okay. So that's the Brussels sprouts. I've been picking all of the lower leaves off of them and feeding them to the rabbits because rabbits love them. <laughs> And since I'm growing all this stuff and the leaves are basically discarded, uh, I can either compost them or I can feed them to the rabbits. And so I feed them to the rabbits because the rabbits feed us. So that's what I wanted to do. Uh, these bed number two contains all of my excess broccoli and kale at the very end here. Uh, in between the two, I have this pomegranate that needs weeded. So we get a lot of weeds. Weeds are nature's way of recouping the soil. So any soil that's uncovered, um, nature says that it needs, it needs help, <laughs> it needs protection, and so it plants weeds there.
so what I just picked, what I just picked is mallow. Uh, this, the rabbits will eat. So as I go around weeding the garden, I feed it to the rabbits because they, they need food too. Anyway, bed number three is my broccoli bed, uh, broccoli and onions. So I have red onions growing in there and some accidental carrots. I don't mind. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, I'll eat them. I also have, I believe, other plants growing uh, along the border over here. And they were self-sown, so I'm not sure not sure if it just survived through the winter or what, but there they are. In bed number four, we have lettuce that has, has basically sprung up quite well. It wasn't that big a few days ago, uh, so the warmer temperature and the watering and fertilizing has helped quite a bit. My tomatoes my tomatoes are trellised, so I have them on this string, and the string goes up to the top, if you can see it. But I cut off all of the lower branches, all of the lower growth, and basically it's a chop and drop, so I leave it on the, the ground down there, because it will provide nutrients for the tomatoes as they start growing, and it starts decomposing. But all of my tomatoes have all of the lower branches, all of the lower growth cut off. So I don't remember which ones were the beefsteak because I didn't write that down. And yes, Kim is going to yell at me for that because she says I'm getting old and I'm not going to remember stuff and I need to write everything down and then I don't. But in the meantime, I am fixing up and trellising all of my indeterminate tomato plants. So they'll grow there. And as they start growing up, they're going to shade a lot of the, the leaf, the leafy greens down here, which are both lettuce and calendula. Calendula are very similar to marigolds, and marigolds are great companion plants for tomatoes. So I grow them instead of marigolds because calendula has uh, medicinal properties that marigolds do not. So that's why I choose the calendula instead. And of course I have a ton of calendula that's self-sown from last year and it's everywhere. So I left it. On the other side of the tomato beds I have artichokes. Uh, these are, I have three different varieties, uh, a green, a red, and a purple I believe. Uh, don't quote me. Anyway, so this whole line over here are artichokes. Artichokes need a lot of room to grow. I am not in a good zone for artichokes, so uncovered, unprotected, they are an annual. Unfortunately, it takes two years of growth for artichokes to start producing the flower that we then eat before it opens and blossoms. So the artichoke that we would harvest would not come up if not protected. So that's why I'm growing them in the high tunnel so that during the winter I can protect them, uh, insulate them. I'm gonna do a serious thick mulch with them so that next year I'll be able to harvest off of the artichokes. And I have artichokes all the way down uh, bed number four and bed number seven. Uh, so bed number four is 24 feet long, bed number seven is only 16 feet long, and I have them spaced out every two feet. Ow! Okay, so artichokes are really spiny, so be careful when you go to touch them <laughs> that you don't get poked. So anyway, those are the artichokes. I do need to start uh, weeding around them. Uh, last year I had corn and beans in this area and a lot of the beans fell and they're self-sowing So I have a ton of beans coming up in most of this area around here So I've been pulling those out because I have beans planted with the potatoes over in the northern part of the eastern garden And yes, the garden is so big I have to <laughs> designate different areas drives Wes nuts, but it is what it is. 
So bed number five, we have bed number five here. This is the center bed. Now the whole center, uh, the way I designed all of the beds were that the outer beds that I can reach from both sides are four feet wide. The center bed is only three feet wide. Uh, that way I can have walkways in between. If I had made it four feet wide, I would have had trouble with being able to bring a wheelbarrow or my gar garden cart through the center, through the, the middle walkways. Uh, I would have had to have gone around the high tunnel the whole year. And winter, that's not happening. Anyway, so this is, this is a lettuce. This was self-sown. Uh, I am going to take it today and feed it to the rabbits. Uh, I let it grow bigger than what I would have harvested for myself, only because it's not as tender and sweet, but the rabbits don't seem to mind. So I let that go um, quite a long time. I did also have different types of radishes self-sown in this area and I've already picked those because they were getting really big and starting to go to seed. So those have been harvested and fed to the chickens and the cows because cows can eat radishes. I don't know how that's going to make the milk taste but we'll see because I milked Mabel this morning so we'll see how how it affects uh, two days later. So bed number six has mostly cabbage uh, and I have two different types of cabbage. Uh, I did start a third type, a friend of mine, uh, also a neighbor. She was born in Taiwan and she still has family and friends there. And she was able to acquire some seeds, some cabbage seeds, specifically a Taiwanese style cabbage. So I'm going to start those probably this this late summer in order to have a fall crop of those. She did warn me that they are huge. <laughs> so I'm, I'm probably looking at like really big cabbage heads, which would be great for feeding to the rabbits. Uh, they definitely love cabbage and one head of cabbage split up between all the rabbits would feed them for quite a long time. But if, if you know anything about rabbits, you want to vary their diet so they get enough nutrients from a, a variety of different plant material. So what I do is I'll go out and like the lettuce that's in bed number uh, five, I'll pick some of that. I'll pick some cabbage. I'll pick the leaves off of the Brussels sprouts and then I'll pick some uh, broccoli leaves. And I put it all together and I disseminate it out between the rabbit cages. Um, that way they kind of have a variety of stuff and they, they'll pick and choose. Most animals are very good about knowing what they're deficient in and will eat what they need in order to have the proper nutrition. So I, uh, I just pick whatever and, and throw it into them. I add a bunch of herbs along with the, the food. So I'll pick some rosemary, sage, uh, lots and lots of oregano. I have that growing everywhere and then throw in some willow branches, throw in some gruesome artichoke leaves, and just kind of toss it in and they, they love it. They see me coming with a bucket and they know they're being fed some nummy stuff. So they're super happy to see me. You can see them climbing up the, the side of the, <laughs> the fencing and yeah, they, they definitely love it. And uh, I like making them happy as long as they're happy rabbits they'll continue breeding and as long as they continue breeding they it'll be great so this is bed number seven it also has uh, the artichokes growing in it uh, this is where my pepper plants are unfortunately because of the change in temperature uh, and the drop and the really cold weather that we had that we should not have had uh, all of my pepper plants are stunted so Super tiny, super small, doesn't look like much is growing. Um, they're like this big, really. So I don't know if I'm going to get any peppers. Uh, I might take certain peppers and transplant them into the greenhouse because I do want stuff like the paprika, the jalapenos, uh, 
I have a Peruvian pepper that another friend found uh, for me. It came straight from Peru, uh, just, a, just a single little pepper. I let it ripen, harvested the seeds, and was able to start plants from that. And I definitely want to try that out. I didn't eat the Peruvian pepper plant because I wanted to, I wanted to grow it. Uh, so I'd like to be able to try it and see how it tastes. So I'm, I'm probably going to transplant some of them into the greenhouse just because it, it doesn't look like these are going to produce much. I have enough bell peppers and uh, serranos in the freezer. I froze them from last year's harvest, which by the way, last year I also had a cold problem. Uh, late May is when I planted them out. These ones, early June, I planted them out and still this is what I've got. Bed number eight has my fig tree. Uh, I am going to graft branches off of this fig tree and have two more fig trees inside the high tunnel. Uh, it's a cold hardy fig tree, but I want more cross-pollination and I want to be able to produce more figs for fresh eating. Figs are one of those that um, you can't pick it and ripen it on the counter. Pears you can, apples you can, but figs you cannot. So you either pick it when it's ripe and eat it, or you don't. This bed is also kind of a catch-all. Uh, the whole center is, is really kind of a catch-all, so there was extra space in some of the center beds. And when I started, uh, say I started 32 um, broccoli seeds and I got all 32 to sprout, and then I transplant it and I can only get 30 into a bed, the last two would then be planted in the overflow beds so that they could still grow and I could still harvest and produce. If you saw the broccoli bed and the, the cabbage bed, you'd see that there was empty spaces and that's because the transplanting um, killed off some of those delicate starts I think next time, this fall, probably August time frame, when I start more seeds, I'm going to wait until they're a little bit bigger. I'm going to up pot them and then transplant them. That way I can have a better, um, better success rate in the transplanting and then better success in the harvesting. So anyway, these are a catch-all bed. So it does have broccoli, cauliflower. Uh, it might have a Brussels sprout or two in here. I believe that there's some herbs growing in here, like um, some basils. I did, I did start a ton of basils. So anything from licorice basil to just the normal sweet basil and everything in between. So I have a whole variety of basils. Most of my basils are in the greenhouse um, just because it was getting cold over and over and over again and they needed to be planted, otherwise they were gonna die. So they ended up in the greenhouse, which is fine. I had some extra room in between the, the tree pots and so I kind of interplanted them in there. And that has, um, has worked out really well. So I have a bunch of basil in there and then other herbs out here that were a little more uh, cold hardy. Bed number nine is the cauliflower. And you can see there's a whole lot of empty space over here and that's because of the transplant failures that we had, which it happens. It's not ideal. It's not, uh, it's not fun to look out and watch your plants dying after all of the work we put into making sure that they survive the starting process, they survive the hardening off process, and then you transplant them and they just go So. So it's a little, it's a little disappointing, but my overflow bed is looking really good. I think all of those actually survived while some of these did not. So having an overflow bed allows me to, to be able to make up for what we've lost in this bed.
So down from the cauliflower bed, we have three beds here that look like a whole lot of stuff is growing in them, but that's just weeds, uh, except for this bed. I have tomatillos right there, but I definitely need to pull the weeds and start mulching. My farm helper's coming out and we have a bunch of grass clippings. So we're gonna, we're gonna mulch these three beds and prevent these weeds from getting any worse and any new ones from from popping up so these three beds here this bed i have been meaning to put my um, sweet potato uh, slips in here because i wanted to grow in this bed we sifted all of the the rocks out of it to make sure that it was good to go but then i never did get around to actually planting the slips in there so they're in the greenhouse looking really really sad and if I don't transplant them, they're going to die. And I didn't save any of the other sweet potatoes. These are a purple variety. It has a purple skin and a purple flesh. So if I don't save them, then I got to go find these uh, sweet potatoes again, which was pretty darn difficult. So that, that's the high tunnel. High tunnel number one. Uh, this one is the, uh, the majority of the produce that we're going to be growing and producing. Produce. Producing. So this is row number two of the Eastern Garden. Um, we're at the very edge of it where it starts my arena. Uh, the arena has not been sanded, so there's a bunch of weeds that we have to continually mow. The, the idea was to have trees along the fence line, but with Wes not being able to mow behind the trees, between the trees and the fence, we had to pull all those out and move them. In doing so, I think we killed probably three of the 10 that we transplanted, which is unfortunate, but it happens. Uh, as you can see, Maggie here holds down all the plants in the rows, making sure that they don't go anywhere. I have some perennials and annuals growing in this row here. Uh, the first one is a rose, Enchanted Peace. Uh, it's going to be a bushy type of rose, but it's going to be kind of a centerpiece or a focal point for this particular row. So as you drive past on the road, you're going to see a rose instead of produce, which is fine. And then right behind the rose, I have amaranth growing. Uh, some of them are doing pretty good and some are a little sad, so we'll, uh, we'll just let them be. Um, if this one dies, it dies. If not, then it may be stunted or it may grow big. So we'll, we'll wait and see. Along the same row, we have the, the rows and the amaranth, we have four of these trellises. This first one here is for the pickling cucumbers. Um, I do want to make some pickles this year, or I want to try my hand at that. I haven't done it yet, so I definitely want to try it. And then we have munching cucumbers, a new variety. I got free seeds from rareseeds.com. They are uh, Baker Creek uh, seeds. So I'm going to try that new kind of cucumber. And then, of course, the far end, I have a lemon cucumber, which has been very popular with everyone that has, has had them. They are uh, very, very good tasting. I love them. So I'll chop those up with some cherry tomatoes and mix them in and eat them just as they are with a little bit of salt. So uh, we're going to try the new cucumber and, of course, all the other three. And this is what's on this row here. So my blackberry bushes are doing pretty good. I did not trim them uh, last year, so some of the growth I'm going to have to do a little research on how to trim these specifically because um, I don't want to damage the plant and I don't want to trim up stuff that would otherwise provide us with fruit. So I definitely need to do some research on that. <coughs>
So this dog over here will charge the fence, antagonizing mine, and gets mine to start barking. It's really annoying. But let's go somewhere else. Row number one has, the very first is boysenberry. Uh, these look very, very sad because they were transplanted earlier this year and um, didn't like it. So this is the second time they've been transplanted since I've had them. But I think this is a permanent location. I have the trellising up with two posts on both ends. And so they'll be able to grow up. <coughs> They'll be able to grow up and create kind of a, a fencing type of look. So it'll kind of just take over this whole area. Uh, where they were before, they started intermixing with the blackberries. And I didn't like that because these are very spiny. You have to wear gloves to handle these. Otherwise, you're going to have uh, little needles all over in your skin. So definitely don't want that to happen. So this entire first row is going to be berries. I do need to weed along here. And this area right here still needs bark. We did get a load of bark, so we'll be able to do that. But this, this is all gonna be berries. And then of course we have blackberries, which are going to extend down quite a bit further because uh, we definitely like blackberries. And then in between the blackberries, and the raspberries is an empty space. I'm going to clear out those blackberries and move them to the other side, all the way at the other end. And then the raspberries can grow along here. So I have a bunch of um, little starts growing outside of the area that I want them to grow. So this fall, I will transplant them to this area here. So in the spring, so come next spring, they will be um, growing significantly well at that point. So this is the tour of the entire southeastern gardens. It's the high tunnel and the two individual rows. And the rows are the berries and the, the trellises. Next year, I've already got plans on what I'm gonna do with those because you have to rotate crops. Um, well, you don't have to. There's different things that you can do instead. But I'm going to be rotating some of those crops. I have been asked uh, Instagram, Facebook, uh, different places um, about this. So this is a trellis design. I saw it um, during my my search uh, on DuckDuckGo, I uh, started searching for trellis ideas and, because I wanted to grow my, uh, my grapes up some type of decorative trellis rather than just a standard grow it and run it along um, lines. I wanted to do something much more decorative, much more uh, pleasing to the eye. And this image popped up. The image was in a field, uh, behind it was a sun setting, so it was a really neat color. Uh, the, the arch was a very dark color uh, because of the shadowing effect, but I really, really liked this. Now this isn't going to be grape stuff, so I, I took a screenshot of it, I saved it for future reference, and then I went on to find what I wanted to do with my grapes. And then I went back to this and I thought, oh, I want to really, I really, really, really want to build that. And so I went on to a local marketplace and found some reclaimed uh, barbed wire, which is great because a lot of times people will just down their barbed wire and then animals will get tied up in it. I know this for a fact because in 2012, I was riding my horse who decided to get super, super spunky. So I got off and I started walking her, hand walking her. And we got to an area where she scraped her back leg against the ground and caught some downed wire. It was not barbed wire, thank God. Otherwise that would have ended very poorly. Much more poorly than what it ended up being. Um, 
so it's smooth wire down and it scared her because she was already hyper and, and just all over the place. And so she started running circles around me with the wire still attached to her hook. So the wire ended up getting caught on my feet, knocking me to the ground and knocking me to the ground scared her more. <laughs> so my right foot and her back legs were all tied up in the wire and she goes to bucking. And I am being thrown about like a rag doll. And during the incident, I'm, I'm trying to pull on her reins and I'm trying to tell her to stop. I'm telling her, whoa, and I'm, I'm trying to get her to just stop and stand still. I felt some popping in my ankle and I thought, oh, I think my foot just came off my, my leg. And I just went limp. I, I thought, oh, this is over. This is, this is gonna be terrible. I went limp and my foot slipped out of the boot and then the horse took off and i'm sitting there thinking oh, had i only just relaxed in my boot in the beginning i wouldn't be in this mess anyway long story short i uh i wasn't in as bad a condition as i would have been had it been downed barbed wire. So pick up your wire, people. I know, I was trespassing. Just don't tell anybody. Anyway, so I ended up with a, an ambulance ride to the hospital, had five torn ligaments, I uh, was in a boot, and I finally was able to walk on my own after 12 weeks. So lots of physical therapy, lots of uh, x-rays, MRIs, um, Basically, it was, it was a lot of scanning just to, to see my progress. And I was, originally I was told that I was going to have surgery. They just didn't know what part they were gonna do surgery on yet. Well, I ended up not having surgery, followed doctor's orders, did exactly what I was supposed to do, but I, I followed doctor's orders and I was walking. And I'm still walking. I still have to do my exercises because I find that my, uh, my ankle will get weak every now and then and and I have to do the, the exercises again just to strengthen everything up and make sure that I'm not gonna re-damage anything. But the, the, the moral of the story is pick up your wire. So I used Reclaim Wire to make that. I am going to grow my tangerine size Arboros on that side. And then on this side, I'm gonna grow Clematis and it's a nice purple flower. So the orangish yellow color of the tangerine rose uh, with the purple flowers, I think are gonna give a really good color contrast. It's gonna make this area just beautiful. So that's the story behind that. Anyway, so I'll, uh, I'll walk you through the rest of the garden another time. Um, that was uh, plenty for today, I think. It is getting hot out. It's supposed to be in the 90s today. 103 tomorrow. I'm going to let the uh, the water continue on the plants for now. I'm going to give it a really good soak and then um, make sure that everything is got what it needs to survive the hot temperature tomorrow. All right. Well, we'll see you again next time. Bye.